Well, hello everyone, and welcome to my talk. And uh, this talk is going to be a technical talk, so, but uh, hopefully there's something here for you. Um, so I'm going to go over what we're going to be talking about. Um, a lot of uh, shader code can be very intimidating in the words of another fellow tech artist um, in a talk yesterday, and it made them want to barf. Uh, so this used to make me feel that way as well. And I would like to hopefully show you some kind of thought processes and techniques that you can use to kind of help break things down and make it not so scary. And we're going to be using just a lot of kind of operations that may be familiar to you. Um, uh, simple ones like uh, sine waves, cosine waves, cross products, dot products, all the general stuff which um, maybe you've been scared to use before, maybe you're very familiar, um, but we're going to be covering some of those things. And really, we're just going to be really looking at how we can isolate particular pieces of information and visualizing them so that we can really um, understand what's going on. And yet, yeah, visualizing on the screen and in your head. <clears throat> I want you to think geometrically. So we're not just reading um, some abstract um, instruction on, on the paper or on the screen and um, robotically transforming that into nodes. I want to actually be able to see these things in your head um, in, a, in a physical way so we really know what's going on with vectors and surfaces and how it all works together. So hopefully you can uh, train your own brain and build your own neurons to kind of uh, forge your own um, way of tackling problems. So I'm a senior technical artist. Um, I work at Epic Games and I've worked in the game industry for eight months. And yeah, I work on Fortnite, um, and I won't be talking about Fortnite today, but a lot of the concepts and uh, ideas shown here, um, <coughs> they are used in Fortnite. So we'll have some kind of um, similar things in there as well. Uh, but I didn't just start in the game industry without any experience. I've, uh, I was at Weta for 10 years, and before that did lots of very um, kind of CG um, journalist type stuff in London. So um, yeah, been around. Uh, so, what, what do we mean by maths? What, what's maths? Um, so, we have kind of two forms, really, that we're going to be covering. One is uh, shader code, which is kind of function notation and um, lots of uh, kind of flow control, for loops, that kind of thing. And then we have mathematical notation, which is a bit, maybe a bit more abstract to some people and a bit hard to, harder to decode. We'll cover some, some of that as well. And when I say nodes, when, when we're turning this into nodes, there's different kinds of nodes. There's different node systems. So we have uh, we have Blueprint. Um, but we're going to be looking at mainly material nodes. So Blueprints are great if you're doing kind of a higher level behavioral type logic in your game. But we're really taking some shaders and turning that into actual pixel, you know, actual material graphs that runs on the GPU as vertex and pixel shaders. So we're going to be looking at three kind of um, situations here. So we're going to be looking at um, a random generation system where um, we have these puddles on the ground. That's kind of what I'm most interested in here, where we will kind of imagine you want to kind of randomly apply something to a surface, but you don't want to use decals. You kind of want to just have a shader that gives you variation across a surface that doesn't look repetitive. That's what these puddles are. Um, this is a shader that kind of randomly applies with random rotations and scales and stuff across a whole surface and doesn't repeat forever, and you can um, just use it. And this is just kind of a silly example of it being applied to a whole landscape, and it will kind of just infinitely apply everywhere, and wherever you go, you'll get these random splats. Now, I wouldn't do leaves that big. This is just an example. <clears throat> and then the other example I want to do is Gerstner Waves which is a nice kind of uh, semi-procedural way to get kind of open ocean waves. And there's loads of tutorials online. You can probably find out you know, how to do this yourself. But I'd like to use this as a good example of how to break down some, some notation because this appears in the GPU Gems book, which is a really kind of bit of an old book now, but it's really got some, some gems in there. And <coughs> it's... Um, the, even the, the previous example, um, that was from GPU Gems as well. And then the last thing I want to do is kind of um, 
showing how you can use a lot of those kind of geometric ideas and apply them. Um, and uh, in this case, what we're doing is we're taking um, the scene and we're kind of looking at certain properties of the scene and uh, we're doing some sort of magic uh, UV manipulation here to have the water kind of go around obstacles. That's kind of a fun one that I, um, I quite like. So let's go into this uh, simple expression. If you um, type into your search engine, you know, shader random noise generation, then one of the answers is from Stack Overflow and just pops up. And it's kind of a kind of a copy and paste, drop it in your kind of shader code uh, random function that if you give it a 2D vector, it will give you back by like random noise, basically. <laughs> this is different from Perlin noise, which is kind of smoother and has some kind of structure to it. This is a, a completely random noise where there's kind of really no correlation between um, uh, between the inputs that you give it. So if you give it um, one input, it'll give you a random number. If you give it a slightly different um, input, then you'll get a completely different random number. Whereas uh, Perlin noise and everything else kind of smoothly kind of changes. And the way that we're gonna kind of pass this is we're gonna um, take an, almost an approach that a compiler would. So whenever you <coughs> have shader code, the, the, the shader compiler on your, on your machine, on your workstation, has to kind of split this up into symbols and tokens and pass this into essentially an abstract syntax tree which is kind of the structure that represents the order of operations, uh, where things happen, um, what happens first. You know, the, the, these two things down here are arguments into um, a dot product function, which is an argument into a sign function, which if you go back, you can kind of see uh, that these are the two arguments to that dot function. Now you might be thinking, oh no, do I have to, like every time I see something, like manually go through and pass this into um, some kind of tree. Well, <coughs> I wouldn't go that far, but um, some kind of techniques which we can use to make this a bit easier is instead of kind of going from left to right and kind of building this tree, start from the inside and work your way out. So we're starting at the leaves of the tree. So let's look at this again. And we're thinking, hey, where should I start with this? What should I do? And my first inkling is, hey, let's start, let's try and find the innermost point that um, this uh, expression kind of contains. Like, There's obviously some point where it can't go down anymore. And I'm kind of seeing this um, constant uh, vector 2 inside of all these brackets. So that's kind of a good place to start. And then if I wanted to make that into a node, I create a node. You can hold the 2 key and click in the material uh, graph and it will create you a a 2D vector node for you. And um, that kind of looks like this purple arrow here. Now, this code or XY, this is kind of um, a 2D, this is a 2D vector. So what we can do is we can pass in our UV coordinates and our UV coordinates are all 2D vectors. Every position in the 2D kind of plane of UV coordinates is a, is a 2D vector. So let's plug that in and these kind of all exist in, in the world in this kind of 2D plane as well. So we create a texture coordinate node, which I'm going to provide for you. And then we do a dot product, which um, maybe it's scaring some of you. Maybe some of you are thinking, oh, this is this is fine. But uh, it's, it's good at this point to, to wonder, what is this dot product doing? And why are we giving it two vectors? So essentially, there's different ways to interpret a dot product. And I'm not going to show you the definition because that's, that's not useful at all. But if we give it two vectors, then we're going to be given back a floating point value. And that value is going to be equal to the length of where one vector is projected onto the other. So that's quite useful. We can take one vector uh, and where it lands uh, at a perpendicular to another vector is um, we'll get that length along that, that first vector. So we can, say for instance, take the UV coordinate 1, 1 and project it onto this uh, vector here and we'll get a length which is that long. If 
we were going to take the UV coordinate of 0.5, no, 1.5, then it gets projected and we get that length. And in fact, all of the uh, vectors along this line, that line there, all get that same length. So essentially, what we're doing is we're creating our own gradient in a particular direction where this orange line is that orange line where all the values are the same. So this direction is encoding a direction along which we're creating a gradient. Now, what would, what would happen if we did that to all um, the, the UV coordinates? Then essentially, we are taking the whole plane, <coughs> squashing it down into this kind of one dimensional gradient. And what I'd like you to do, well, I was, I was going to ask you all to tilt your heads to kind of align with that purple vector, but I don't want to cause any injuries, so I will flip it for you. There we go. So now we've got that kind of one-dimensional num number line that's just going um, from some really big negative value all the way up to some positive uh, value. Um, and then we come to the sine wave, which um, sine waves are great. They go up and down, they're wavy, they're really cool. Uh, what if we plug in our one-dimensional number line into the sine wave? Well, then we get a sine wave. We'll get a sine wave in that direction. So that gradient is going from you know top left down to bottom right, and uh, we get a lovely sine wave that goes from negative one to positive one. What about if we um, multiply it by some huge number? That's what's happening next. You know, we've 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 come out to the sine wave bit. We've kind of um, reached out parentheses, which enforce um, the grouping and the evaluation in that order. And then we're going to multiply this big number. What does that do? Well, it multiplies the negative one to positive one by that big number. You know, we get, we get a sine wave that's really bright and really dark. So if we were, if we were to zoom in and be able to look at the pixel values, We'd probably see, you know, at any one region, we'd we'd see something like this where we have some value that's in, you know, in, you know from negative one to positive one, and then the one above it is going to be less than that, and the one below it is going to be more than that, um, or well, depending on where you are in the negative one to one space, but um, the one next to it is going to be uh, like slightly less because it's just a little bit above that kind of orange line, and the one next to it is going to be slightly more because it's kind of just below that kind of line. So we have, you know, this is just indicative, but uh, you kind of get the point. So let's multiply it by that big number. So now we have a bunch of big numbers and they're all just kind of big versions of that sine wave where this central one is, yeah, it's, um, it's, uh, it's this number, and the one above it is slightly less, and the one below it is slightly more. We've not really changed our pattern. But if you're going to look closely, <coughs> then if you ignore all of the kind of sort of actual whole number part and look at just the fractional part, suddenly that whole kind of um, space has been stretched out. And we've got these fractional parts that really have no kind of correlation. They're, they're, they're looking pretty random. So if only we had a node that gave us the fractional part of a number, then we could end up with something like this. And that's where we use the fract, the fract node. Um, it's, uh, it gives you the, the fractional component. Wonderful. We've made some random noise. And what do we do? We're kind of looking at some hazy stuff. I don't really know. What can we do with it? Well, um, a common tech art operation is to tile your UVs. Hopefully that extends beyond tech art as well. I'd like to think that everyone can take advantage of multiplying and tiling their UVs to apply across the surface. But that can result in um, some kind of repetitive nature where you can, the human eye is very easily able to see um, repeating patterns. So we're trying to trick our brains here. So we want to kind of randomly place splats around. And your first intuition is, right, we have a random number generator. Let's get 
our pixels. Let's get our kind of tiles here and let's move the pixel somewhere else. But that's not going to be so good because um, because GPUs don't really work that way. You can't work in your current pixel and send it somewhere else because each pixel, um, each kind of inv invocation of this material graph runs on a single pixel completely independently of all the other pixels. They don't know about each other. They can't really exchange information unless you do something really complicated under the hood. But we can actually flip it around. We can say, right, when I multiply my UVs, uh, I know who I am. I have a certain ID. Um, and then I also know who the person next to me is and the person to the left of me and the person above me. So each um, region, when we multiply it and do a floor operation, gets this kind of um, unique uh, cell ID which is just literally the, the, the UVs multiplied and then turned into an integer. And then we can feed that integer because it's a whole group of pixels now that have that same ID. We can feed that into these, this random node and we'll get back the same answer across the whole group of pixels. And we can use that to offset the image just locally, just, just for this cell. We know we're all the same cell. We agree. We can we can move ourselves, but we do have this thing now where the image is cut off because it can't. The, the next cell doesn't know about that. Well, what if it did? What if that cell could reach up to its neighbor and say, "Hey, I'm I'm ID two comma three. I know you, uh, ID." Two comma two. What's your random number? Give me your number, and I'll sample the texture that ends up in me. And you can do that to your left guy, to your left cell, and your diagonal cell. And you're done. Four texture samples each time sampling your neighbor with a known predictable random number to get that texture into your cell. Now this is what the code looks like in GPU gems. And I actually did this. I actually went through, did it bit by bit, created the nodes. And then I kind of thought, well, this, this bit here is okay, but we've got these nested for loops. Like how do you do that with nodes? Well, this is kind of a, a nice property of for loops that where you have a known fixed iteration size is that you can kind of unroll this and flatten it out and if you know you have four samples just call the node four times so here's a quick overview of just the the beginning section where we're multiplying the uvs and we're flooring them to get our cell ids um, and that's being fed into these four texture samples where you can see that there's the cell off offsets we're getting back uvs um, which are the offset UVs. And we're literally sam sampling and we composite them together. This is a cheap composite, just using some LERPs that I would use a proper method. But um, this uh, technique isn't limited to just uh, splatting and um, texture splatting. The same concept is used to do Voronoi uh, noise generation. So if you see up here in, the, in this um, bit of code up here, then it's got that same random number generation. Down here, we're doing a loop. This time it's looping over kind of nine cells. So it's like your bottom left cell up to your top right cell. So it's like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And it's finding, it's doing a random number for that cell. And it's literally finding the, the, the smallest distance. And then that's how you generate uh, frontal noise. So now we come to Gerstner waves. Moving on, now we come to Gerstner waves. Um, so this is a uh, interesting one because it's got a lot of new notation and it's definitely more mathematical and abstract, which may be a bit scary. I mean, it used to scare me a lot. What are all these symbols and how do they relate to each other? What's this big funny E thing that's um, 
that's uh, in there. And why is this in big brackets? Yeah, it's a bit weird. So the paper kind of first, you know, to its credit, it does say, right, we're going to look at one single wave because, you know, we're not going to overwhelm you just yet. Uh, so what we do is we take this expression and we evaluate it and we get a wave. And it's like, okay, but um, I need to know some more information. There's, there's a lot of symbols here. And we also need some way to apply this to something. We need, we need to run this on some geometry, right? So in this case, I created a mesh. I think you can create a mesh in Unreal now using the geometry uh, scripting. Um, I think this might have been created in Houdini. I'm not, I can't remember, but or Maya. It's one of those programs that imported. There's also a water plane uh, content example well, um, on the launcher, which you can download. I think this might actually be from there. I'm not sure. And the way we're going to do this is we're going to be reading in a, uh, we're going to be creating an offset to each of these vertices and plugging it into the world position offset. So, that, so this is a slot on the material graph that takes a vector and will literally move the, ver the, the vertex depending on the expression that you give it. So um, the, the kind of things that you want to be thinking about when you're looking at an expression like this is, OK, um, are they scalars or are they vectors? You know, are they a single floating point value or a vector? And normally the, the paper or the chapter will tell you. Um, sometimes they don't. And it's a bit hard to kind of figure it out. But, um, you kind of have to just stare at it for years and years until it kind of makes sense. Or the other thing is you can like look up some implement a blog post or an implementation of someone that has worked it out. And, um, so these are all the kind of questions that you should ask yourself when coming up with something new. Like the range of the values, do they have a fixed range or are they kind of are they zero to one? Are they all positive? Are they like zero to some big number or are they negative one to one? Um, is it a container? No, no, no. Don't go near those. So, yeah. And what is the function taking in? Is it a, is it UV coordinates? Is it positions? Um, does that is that position from a mesh? Is that a vertex color? Um, does the is it a constant? Is it just a single value for every single vertex? Um, what nodes are we gonna, are we going to use from Unreal to get these? These kind of the kind of things you've got to think about. So this tells you the state of each wave is a function of horizontal position, x, y, and time, t. So we have this w wave function, um, which um, we also have this d direction vector, which is horizontal vector perpendicular to the wave. So that's a, it doesn't tell you, but that is a 2d vector, um, which, you know, if you, again, if you stare at this for long enough and work out what's going on, then maybe that's good, I'm not sure. So we have our x, y positions being used here, and that's a 2D vector, and T is being used here, and uh, this is just, mm, maybe this is how you feel. So one strategy when dealing with seemingly complicated things is really just to try and focus on a small part of what's going on. Um, so cover things up, just to ignore them. We know that x, y is a 2D vector. That's our sort of 2D projected down position or UV coordinates maybe, but I'm going to assume it to be like world position x, y. Um, so let's focus on this d dot x, y. Um, so let's turn this into nodes. We create a constant node. This is our direction. And this is inside of a material function, so that's why this input node is here. If you know about material functions, then um, great. If you don't know about them, you can ignore this. Uh, we mask it so that we only take the 2D component of that direction, just in case someone inputs a... Um, the great thing about this node is you can actually... There's a color picker, and you, blah, 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 and you can do that. So we normalize it, and we we store it in this um, direction reroute node, which if you haven't used reroute nodes in, in Unreal yet, they're amazing because they allow you to they allow you to take graphs like this and turn them into this that have this really nice structure and there's no spaghetti code. Um, so we have the direction. We do a dot product with the absolute world position also also masked. 
Does this look familiar? Like a direction and a 2D, a plane of 2D values and a dot product? Well, that's exactly the same as what we did when we did the random number generation. We're essentially taking the 2D world and generating a directional gradient. So we can plug that into a sine wave and we will plug that into the height component of a vector and plug that into the ball position offset. And we kind of get something that looks a bit wavy. Um, I'll fix this in a second. There's a couple of problems here. So it looks wavy and there's no normals. So one word of warning is when using world position offset, you have to you have to calculate normals and <laughs> tell give it to Unreal. So that frequency problem is a bit of an issue. We need a way to tell the wave how how big that distance is between the peaks. And that's typically called the wavelength. And the paper gives you this um, number that you can calculate, which is um, this wave number, which is if you have a parameter L, um, which is like the length in meters between peaks, then you can you can create this W number and then you multiply it. And what that does is it will squash, squash and stretch that sine wave for you. So let's do that. Let's um, create this wave number, it's our wavelength, and we do the calculation. Um, and we multiply that dot product gradient with the wave number. We plug that into the sine wave and we get this. And I also um, did a quick fix for the normals here. So there's this uh, DDX, DDY trick. You can take the rate of change of the position, which will um, give you these vectors of how the surface is changing. And if you have two of those, you can do uh, in both directions, you can do a cross product. Now the issue is that you get flat normals across the whole face. So um, yeah, be careful there. Um, I'll show in a minute, I will actually be showing a fixed version which I've not got in the slides, but um, they use expressions very similar to this to generate um, very nice smooth normals for you. So then we have this T parameter. So this is an input uh, to the function, which is going to be added to that sort of um, direction gradient. And what that is gonna do is it's going to offset our wave horizontally. And what I find really interesting is that if, if we imagine that these blue dots are our vertices, they're going up and down. There's no actual propagation of the vertices. The, the vertices themselves aren't moving with the wave. The wave is an illusion. It's just, it looks like it's traveling left to right. So we can um, get that uh, time value, which um, is also multiplied by this speed parameter which involves the wave number. So um, they actually encode this, um, this symbol here, which represents the speed. And they give you a little calculation for working at that speed. And we, um, well, it says in the paper, it says add that I've subtracted. Um, that just flips the direction. That's not too much of an issue. So then we get this. So yeah, really cool. It's a moving wave. Um, so when you manipulate inputs to functions, you know, we're doing multiplication there um, and we're doing addition. So when you do that multiplication, um, that's gonna squash your sine, your sine wave. And that typically happens with any function. It's going to, uh, a multiplication is gonna be a movement in that direction. And then adding is gonna be a, a shift um, in the input. So now we have um, the thing on the outside, which is our, amplitude and if we kind of um, incorporate that into it it's going to literally multiply that sine wave output and then give you the height of the wave and then that is um, yeah we can output that as a vertical component and that happens after the sine so yeah outputs is a squashing vertically and adding will actually move the weight off the whole thing up and down so yeah, just a little tip, like be careful if you're if you are transforming uh, some kind of expression into nodes, then um, be careful of 
the you know where you, where you place the nodes if they're before or after certain function operations. So then we come to multiple waves, and we have this um, funny looking big E that is. Um, this is a symbol that represents like adding up. Basically, it's, it's some notation. So um, I have to credit Freya Holmer here, um, who came up with this really nice idea of showing some notation as a for loop, which if you just look at the bottom number, then that's kind of your starting index. And the top number is your kind of upper iteration count. And then the, the blue bit is the actual expression that you're kind of um, adding each time. So uh, I've done an N, that's wrong. It should be I. <laughs> Ignore that. Um, so each time we go through this loop, we add. This is essentially what this represents. So we want to go through and add up some waves. We, you know, we've we've got our expression, which is this thing. Now that the I subscript is interesting, is in that each each wave that you do is obviously a certain index and the i means that for each one of those you should probably choose a different value to kind of give it some vari <laughs> variation. So we do what we did before with the random number generation with a loop and we instead of doing a for um, i equals zero we can actually just kind of flatten out that loop and just, just call those nodes as many times as we want, which can get a bit messy. Um, if you're doing anything that involves you know, more than eight iterations, then your graph's gonna start getting pretty beefy. And that's maybe when you want to start looking at HLSL to, for doing loops. Um, yeah, you just gotta be careful with that. So yeah, so here's three waves uh, added together, propagating, uh, constructing, interfering, yeah. But waves don't go just up and down in a sine wave. You know, that looks a little bit artificial and bumpy to me. So um, these two parts of the um, the Gerstner wave, this is what's gonna give us some nice side-to-side uh, -side sloshing movement. And if you look carefully, then a lot of this is just repeated. We have this, the, the, Everything that's going into the sine wave is the same that's going into the cosine wave. And you might be wondering, why is it cosine? You know, um, what, where does that come into it? And what's this Q and that kind of thing? So we want to be able to get these kind of uh, peaky shapes like that. That's what we're after, where we kind of have this like sliding down uh, um, motion. And if we kind of take, take a 2D slice of our sine wave, this is kind of what we want to do. We want to like push in uh, both sides of the wave so that it um, forms this peak. And we need a function that on one side of the sine wave it's negative, and on the other side it's positive, and it's perfectly aligned with that function. Um, luckily, there is a function which is negative and positive on e either side. I mean, we could use a sine wave and offset it, but then that is exactly the same as a cosine wave. Cosine wave is a sine wave that is offset by like this kind of fixed period. And if you look closely here, then you'll see that uh, at the peak of the wave, the cosine has a value of zero. In the middle of the left part, the cosine value is one. So this part here is gonna be pushed positively this way. And if you look at this part where this yellow dot is, the cosine value is negative, so it's going to be pulled in negatively. So this kind of pulling in is controlled by this Q parameter. That's why we get it was kind of you saw that Q in the sort of the cosine section. That's a parameter for the um, whoever's using this to be able to control that that sharpness. And we have to multiply it by this wave number um, so that uh, depending on how many waves we have we don't um, overshoot that sharpness and get like broken peaks. Um, so this is the vertical component down here. And then here we just have the phase coming into the cosine. And um, this graph is pretty much just um, expanding out this expression here. And we're outputting that as part of a material function 
and that's ultimately what is sampled multiple times. So we go from this um, sine wave to this kind of cosine um, sloshing. This is a kind of an extreme flat version, but um, hopefully you kind of get the point. I'll, I've put this slide in here just to kind of show the normals calculation that um, yeah th that it's in there and um, if anyone wants to see more of this then you can come speak to me and ask me and I can pass this along. So yeah I think uh, it's not too hard to get something looking kind of reasonably oceany. Um, yeah. So you might be thinking okay maybe in a whole ocean aren't there millions of vertices isn't this going to be expensive well it kind of depends on your mesh really like um if you you can create an adaptive mesh where near near the player it's very high resolution and further away it kind of goes down in resolution and when the player moves you can actually snap that grid to the player um, so that you you only ever see high resolution near you so that's one way of getting getting around that. The other option is um, you can actually do less waves, so you can do a lot a lot of Gerstner waves, and actually have kind of separate material instances um, for different parts further away that do a lower number, um, different kind of material versions that do a like a, a lower number of Gerstner waves, and further away you might you could even get away with not doing any actual Gerstner waves at all, but just do normal. Gerstner waves. You can do that normal component calculation and apply it just further away. So now we are going to be switching things up a little bit and we're going to kind of be using a lot of these kind of thought processes and tools in our brain to construct something new. So we have a similar setup, some flat geometry that is um, that has UVs and we're going to pan these UVs to, to move water. So I will show you a quick, this is kind of the rough initial starting point. And we want the water to <clears throat> go around these obstacles because that's what water does. So we have like a macro displacement where a larger body of water is kind of pushed out. But then also want some kind of like a um, little um, wrapping around of tiny um, bits in the rock as well. So those two kind of two components are what I'm after. So the macro thing, I want it to be like this, where we're pushing out a big bunch of water that would have gone in through the rock, but because water doesn't go through rocks, we're pushing it out. And then for this kind of local effect, I want this kind of like curly wrapping around of, um, it's a subtle effect, but it kind of it just adds a little bit extra to um, what's going on. So that's where we come to distance fields where distance fields are these amazing thing in Unreal where you can sample anywhere in space. It's a volumetric field. And this is actually the visualization for it now, which actually doesn't do it justice because it looks like a surface, but it is actually a volume. That surface there represents where the volume equals zero. So all of these meshes get rendered volumetri volumetrically into this big global field. And even far away from these meshes, um, a value is kind of placed in the volume, which says, where's the nearest uh, surface? So there's a, yeah, there's a global one. This is maybe, a, this is the older way that um, it was visualized in the engine, which is good for um, letting people know what it does, because as you get further away from a surface, it gets, it gets brighter, which means that, you know, the distance is higher. So if you were to sample out in space, you get a value of like one meter to here. There's also the distance field gradient, which is pretty handy because not only can you find out how far away the nearest surface is, you can find out which direction it's in. Now, this is pretty useful because you're essentially grabbing the normal of um, the nearest surface, but from far away. You're not sampling it at the surface itself. And you can sample it everywhere and you get back a vector, which is this direction. So, um, I'm going to sample this gradient and on this 2D water plane. And the gradient is in world space. And we want to sample it in this 2D plane. 
which is in this kind of texture UV tangent space. And we need some way to transform this world space and embed it in this kind of 2D plane that the 2D plane understands relative to that. And there is a node that does that. Um, we can take the gradient, we can remove its vertical component and use this transform node to go into tangent space. And then now that vector will be uh, good for us. So here we are, we, we take our distance field gradient, we multiply the Z component down, which essentially flattens it. And then we transform that vector into tangent space. And then we um, just make sure that it's a 2D vector. And this is a named reroute node, so we're just kind of saving that off for, for later use. You know, might be might be handy. And then, yeah, flatten it down. Um, so we now have our 2D world space uh, flattened vector, then transform it into tangent space. So now that vector there is embedded in the... Um, it's embedded, and we can use that vector to add to our UVs, which will sample a bit further away now. So we've done some cool displacement. Now, what about this local wrap function? And originally I called it a tangent function, but I thought that was confusing. So I've called it a wrap function because that can, that gets conflated with tangent space. It's all tangents. I'm going off on a bit of a tangent, but um, yeah. So we're going to be using a cross product here, which, uh, Hopefully you know what a cross product is, but it, just in case you don't, this is a quick refresher. If we take any two 3D vectors, then um, they can be pointing anywhere. Uh, but between the two of them, they form a plane. If you get any two vectors, they're going to form some kind of 2D infinite plane. And what the cross product does is it takes those two vectors and gives you back another vector, which is like sticking out perpendicular from that plane. So our operation, um, I've visualized it um, here. So imagine these yellow vectors are the distance field gradient. And they're on the surface here, but you can they exist uh, going away from the surface as well. And if we give uh, the material an overall direction, then we can do a cross product between those two vectors and say, right, OK. So that now gives us a a vector which is like on the surface, it's pointing tangent to the surface, but it's pointing like sideways from that direction. It's, um, it's not exactly what we want. So then if we take that new intermediate vector and cross product with that yellow original normal, then we get this green one, which is pointing in the direction essentially of where we want to go. And that's kind of what it looks like. You get this kind of really cool fairy wraparound uh, vector. And we can use that to displace our UVs just like we could um, with, with, the, with the, the, the macro vector. Um, and we probably want to localize that to near the, the rocks. So we can use the actual distance itself and remap that and then run it through a power function to kind of control like the, the sharpness of that. And power functions are cool because if they are between zero and one, then you can do this thing where a value of one stays at one because you're multiplying one by one, but a value of like 0.5 um, becomes lower. And the gist of it is that low values get low quicker than high values. So you kind of get this like peaking um, kind of sharpening effect. And that's kind of what that looks like here. So we've got this kind of mask that is going to fade off our sort of displacement effect uh, over distance, which is quite nice because we don't want it to affect everywhere. So then we take our cross product, uh, take our cross product um, operation and our macro thing. We add them together, add a bit of a user multiplier, multiply that vector by this kind of mask. And then that's our UV offset. Now I had a go at writing what that expression might look like. I'm still in I'm a, still in the process of doing that. It might look something like this. I don't know. I'm not a mathematician. But um, what I'd like for everyone to kind of take away from this is that 
um, just maths by itself, like shade of code and maths by itself doesn't have to be scary. Um, and I wish that paper authors did a better job of breaking things down for you when, <coughs> when getting across certain concepts. But if you can build your own tools to break things down, visualize, um, build up your kind of toolbox of uh, operations, which are very intuitive to you, then these things start to look way less scary. And you can, you can start to read them and think, okay, I can see what that's doing there. Um, the range there is clipped to this, which means when I run a power function, it's going to do this. And so if you can see in your head these geometric operations, um, then creating these node graphs becomes a lot more fluid and natural. And it's very fun and almost therapeutic and transcendent to do. It's hard to explain when you're creating these node graphs it happens automatically and it's a very nice feeling and I hope that you can do that. I hope that you enjoy that process in whatever you do.